Okay, so do you want to, I know you um, have been really struggling and you really have been through a challenging time yourself. Um, do you want to start with, um, I don't know, maybe where your symptoms began um, and, you know, what, what, caused, what did you believe at the time had caused the um, pain to start? Um, okay, yeah, so the pain started in July 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and we had just been given notice that our house was going to go on the market so we were renting right and we were told that our house was going up for sale and we knew it would sell fast right um so i had to prepare the house for photographs mm -hmm. um i didn't want any of our personal things in the photographs so i, I really went to town on the house right i went crazy like my anxiety was so high i think i spent 10 hours straight wow. just decluttering the house and packing and getting it ready and and i was kind of aware the whole time that i was a bit off the charts right but i just kept going mm -hmm. and that's when the pain started that very day and I believed, you know, I've moved house and moved boxes many, many times. And I often get a bit of a twinge in my lower back when I move heavy boxes around. And I just thought, yeah, that's that'll be fine in two or three days. Right. But it, it wasn't. The, the lower back um, ache was still there about six weeks later. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think to... Sorry, what was that? I started to pay attention. To it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to note that you you weren't there was a lot going on in your life at that time. Uh, yes. It wasn't the sudden sort of moving around of a lot of uh, packing. No. So my partner was in his third year of cancer, mm -hmm. and he had a very rare and aggressive form of cancer, and he'd had already been through um, two rounds of radiation and two lots of surgery. Mm. And we'd also go over to China to try some different treatments over there that are not available in Australia. Right. That would have the pandemic. Okay. Um, we were in and out of hospital a lot during the pandemic. And now, so it, it was 2021. It was his third year of cancer and things were pretty intense. It was pretty clear that his symptoms were getting worse, not better. Right. Our dog had just died from old wow. age. Jeff, my partner, had just been, they just found the cancer in his brain. He'd had a brain scan and he had a brain tumour. And um, he had the brain tumour removed and they were putting him on another round of chemo and radiation. And that's when they told us the house was going to get sold. Wow. Wow. So you have had an incredibly challenging time. I mean, how amazing that it took till that point for you to have uh, an, any pain. Um, you know, the back, so no wonder. So it wasn't really just you moving house, suddenly moving house. It was on top of all the previous few years of all that you'd gone through um, and all the worry you had for your husband. And then suddenly to find you had to move house. Not a good time to move house. So mm -hmm. no wonder. But then at the time, I don't suppose you even considered that because we don't, do we? <laughs> when we don't understand the mind-body link. Um, I was pretty devastated that we had to move house. Yeah. And I could I could sort of feel that I was kind of going into shock a little bit. Right. In the sense that I, I could feel that I was not in my body. Right. Mm -hmm. This the way, the way I was dealing with the, the photo shoot. Yes. You know? The way I was preparing, the way I was preparing and moving through that, I was conscious that I wasn't really in my body and that something wasn't quite right. But I didn't know what to do about it. No, it just quite. what it was. And my partner had a unfortunate. Um, he had unfortunate side effects from his treatment, which meant he got infections a lot. So he would be rushed to hospital quite often, and he was rushed to emergency nine times that year. Wow. Gosh. Whenever he was in emergency, he was in hospital for a week. Um, and he ended up being in hospital the week we were supposed to be moving house. 
which oh. turned out to be a blessing because the landlord took away, we, we rented a furnished apartment kind of thing. And five days before we were moving out, the landlord came and took all the furniture away. Wow. Oh my goodness. I was actually really lucky that Jeff was in hospital at that time because we had nothing to sleep on. So you really went through a lot and, you know, how amazingly resilient are you to get through that? Uh, and and that pain was really part of a protective response, even if you weren't aware of that at the time, protecting you from falling apart emotionally, basically, because you couldn't. You had to be there for Jeff. I couldn't feel any of my own feelings. Mm, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. So how did you cope moving forward? And uh, presumably you went for treatments and tried to deal with the back pain yourself as well as coping with everything else, or did you have to ignore it? I tried, um, I tried uh, first of all, an osteopath, um, because the back pain morphed from back pain into sciatic pain. Mm -hmm. I'd never had before. I was used to having the odd backache from time to time, but I'd never had sciatic pain. Um, so I tried osteopathy first, and then I went to acupuncture, and they did cupping and massage. And I also was seeing a, a psychologist for counselling, which was doing absolutely nothing for me. But wow. I just went. I just kept going week after week because I felt like I needed to try something. Yeah. To kind and of call a bit of time for you to focus on you rather than everything going on. Yes, but it, it did very little, mm. to be honest. Um, Can I just at this moment just say we've got a few people listening in now. Um, if you want to just pop something in the comments box, say hello, let us know where you are. That would be great. At least we know that we're not just talking to each other. <laughs> and then as we're going along, if you've got any questions uh, for Emma at all, then just pop them in the comments box um, and then we'll uh, get to you when we can. So sorry, Emma, you carry on. That's okay. Um, I always believed that my the pain I was feeling in my body was definitely because of stress. Right. I, I I fully believe that, and I, I I thought that these treatments would help alleviate the stress that I was feeling in my body, mm -hmm. but didn't find any practitioners very willing mm -hmm. to help me talk about what I was going through. Right. Yeah. What would often happen, even if I went to an osteopath, I had this experience where as soon as someone put their hands on my body. I would just want to cry. Right. Yeah. No but surprise I, there. When I was not in that situation, when I wasn't in a healing space on someone's table, I did not cry. I did not feel anything. I didn't experience my emotions or feelings. It was only when I was kind of laid on someone's table and they were taking the role of yes. practitioner that I would start to go into my feelings, but mm. no one was willing to go there with me. Wow. How sad is that? I even had a physiotherapist kind of put his hand up and say, I don't deal with that side of things. Talk to your psychologist. Oh, I find that so sad as a practitioner, especially in this field. Oh, my goodness. So that, that was, um, I must have spent about, you know, a couple of thousand dollars on treatments over about six months. And um, I might have got relief for maybe 12 to 24 hours. Yeah, um, my stress level had gone down, or but then it would just come back. Yeah, and I guess I expected that after we moved house, the pain might improve. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't. We our situation continued to be really extreme. Mm. We moved out of one house and into another house, and experienced financial difficulty, and were threatened with eviction. Oh, uh, the situation only resolved on just to give you a time frame the situation only resolved on the 16th of December and on the 23rd of December my partner was rushed into hospital with another infection um, and fever and on this occasion they told him he had maybe two to three weeks to live wow Gosh. Um, that was on Boxing Day Oh, oh, oh wow, Emma. 
Mm -hmm. Is it any wonder that you have this pain to help you keep holding yourself together? And actually, you know, the, the recurring infections, you know, the stress that you were all under, both under as well, significant for you both. Yeah. So, um, again, I thought, you know, it was caring for Jeff at the end of his life was very, very hard. He was, we decided to care for him at home because COVID was around. Mm. And there were restrictions in place. And if he was cared for in hospital, none of his family would have been allowed to see him. So Gosh, if he did anything else going on. <laughs> Although it was a massive undertaking, that was what that was my choice to do that at home. So I was only sleeping four or five hours a night for the last two or three weeks, oh. and um, managing a very busy schedule during the day of all mm. his uh, meals and visitors and laundry and all the different things. And yeah. Yeah, sure. again, I, I anticipated that when the the enormous pressure lifted, that that I would get better. Mm. And were, were you able to cope with all of that, with your back pain? I mean, were you able to do the laundry and everything? How was it impacting you? Yeah. Um, so the pain had started in July, and by the by October, I had started taking painkillers. Mm -hmm. So I was taking Voltaren, and twice a day, kind of at twelve hour intervals, and supplementing that with like Panadol and Nurofen. So nothing heavy nothing too right. heavy that was getting me through but mm. I was very anxious about the painkillers I was taking because it says on the packet you know do not take these painkillers for more than two weeks right Gosh. Well, I was really anxious that I was having to take I was taking them now for well we were at four months I've been taking painkillers yeah. for four months and I was very anxious about what they might be doing to my insides or you know my my gut and I'm presuming they weren't do anything else where i used to live in that in the byron shire it's a very health conscious part of the world right a lot of vegans everyone's into yoga people go running on the beach every morning and that was a part of the pressure that i was feeling that i wasn't healthy enough i wasn't taking care of myself i was oh. feeling a little bit down that i've you know i've got into a situation where i'm having to take these drugs every day and I yes. was really putting a lot of pressure on yourself then because yeah. you weren't fitting what you felt you should be um, to yeah. look at how you were supposed to be living and looking. And in, in the end, I ended up taking painkillers for 18 months. Right. And I'm fine. They didn't do anything. <laughs> like Great. <laughs> and you stopped <laughs> when you were able to. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as you said, you know, even after Jeff died, the pain didn't settle down. No surprise there. It got um, worse. It got worse. Right. I don't think I could really, um, I couldn't deal with the volume of different feelings and emotions I was experiencing at that time. I, I, I really mm -hmm. see that it was my body's way of dealing with the, the grief. Yeah. Yeah. It's better for me to feel physical pain than emotional pain. Yeah. And that's basically it, is that it's we feel safer feeling that physical pain than actually letting people see the authentic us that feels so threatening to us. I don't think the authentic me would have been acceptable in the society that we live in. Absolutely. We, don't, we don't have practices in place really for people grieving. No. Not like other cultures who spend a week maybe yes. with the whole community together community support. together wailing yeah. yeah making all different sounds letting the, the the feelings come out of their body we don't have anything like that. And do, you remember, do, do you know i watched a, a um a documentary a while ago of um somebody visiting lots of different islands remote islands with indigenous people and when they they spent i think a month on one island and when they left the whole community got together with him surrounding him and they all cried together for the loss of him leaving and i remember at that time thinking oh my goodness i bet they don't get back pain <laughs> and <laughs> <to> your symptoms <laughs> but it's right and the fact that you you can't go to your physiotherapist or osteopath and be able to just let go and express how you feel when 
because they're not aware of how relevant that is to the situation you're presenting with. Uh, it's yeah. So we we just feel we cannot show our authentic selves. It's not safe. What would people think of us? Um, and it just feels really threatening to be able to do that. Hence, a lot. It's a lot more acceptable to have pain of some sort, or some sort of physical yeah. problem. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I ended up. It's probably taken me a year and a half to fully recover from the the death of my partner and the caring that came first and just how terrifying that whole experience was. Mm. But our society is not really kind of forgiven in that sense. I would have expected to have been back at work after two or three months. Mm. But because I had physical pain, that was acceptable, yeah. more acceptable. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. Easier to give us a note for that. Yes, and it, and it gave me a reason to leave places when I didn't want to be there anymore. It gave me yeah. excuse. It gave me yeah. a way of saying things. It gave me mm. boundaries. Absolutely. So when when was it that you started recognizing there was a way out? Um. So unfortunately, this extreme circumstances continued. Um, right. five, weeks, five weeks after Jeff died, um, I don't know if it was on the news in the UK, but there was a massive flood in northern New South Wales. Um, in some parts of the country, the water was 14 metres high. Wow. Um, wow. My house was flooded, but I had an upstairs, so I was able to be in a safe space to some extent. Um, mm. But the water came into my house up to the knees. Right. And where I lived, backed onto a river and all the power went out and everyone was trapped in their homes. The internet went down, mobile communications went down and you could hear the boats going up and down on the river all night looking for people to rescue. And um, obviously Jeff had only been gone about four or five weeks at this point and going through that experience without him was just... Horrendous. Horrendous. But I was... Couldn't I'm the kind of person that I can't I find it hard to relax at times. I'm always kind of on the go, I've got a busy mind. Uh, so I spent the time trapped in my house, lifting and carrying things from downstairs. Um, I don't know how I did it, but the adrenaline is a very strong yes. very strong force. So I lifted things during the flood that I could not lift in normal life. And wow. although I had sciatica, it wasn't like back pain that stops you doing things. Right. I could often be, I could often be fine if I just stood up all day. Right. I hadn't, okay. I hadn't yet got to the worst part of the pain. The worst part of the pain is yet to come. Um, so I lifted, I lifted and carried things for maybe 10 hours straight during the flood. I, I lifted a 32 kilogram amethyst geode that I've got. And I can't lift it on a normal day. But I did that yeah, day. It's amazing um, what we do when we need to. Mm. A big wooden chest. I carried a big wooden chest on my sh on my chest up the stairs. Oh, God, I, I was not. I was like, I'm not letting this, these things get no. ruined in the. Floor. And I knew, mm. I knew after that day that I was going to be in a lot of pain the next day. Right. But I couldn't stop myself doing those things. Mm -hmm. And I was in a lot of pain. Um, and then. After the flood, the, the owners where I lived wanted to move into the house, so I had to move again. Wow, well, just goes on and on, doesn't it? It went on and on for some time, and it was only after that second move, I moved up to Ipswich, which is where my parents live, and I rented a little house, and I took a lot of drugs to get here, mm -hmm. and then it collapsed, and that mm. was it. Wow, so, that, so you finally settled there. <laughs> After, yeah. so we were six, ten months in now, and that is right. when the pain got really, really, really bad. Yeah. When so, everything was fine. Over. I was just about to say that. When finally you're able to relax and you've got family as well there. But how extraordinary for you to be able to actually navigate. As Susie said, your story is extraordinary and navigating an tax, tiny fraction 
of your ordeal is amazing. Absolutely. It's incredible that you've got not only had to traverse all of that, but that look at look at where you are now. And we'll we'll come to that. But what a, an incredible woman you are, Emma, to have gone through that and come out the other side. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Um, sorry? I'll do my happy dance later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, do, do. Because there was clearly not enough self-compassion at the beginning because you weren't aware that that's what was needed um, and no time for you. So the whole thing was incredibly challenging. Through the... Um... Through the whole experience with my partner, my, my my dialogue at that time in my life, I just never felt like I did enough. Mm. No matter what I did, I felt like it was just never enough. I, I kind of felt like his life was in my hands a lot of the time. I can imagine. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. I, remember, I remember my new... father saying to him before he died that no matter what you do, you'll never think it's enough. You know, whether it's your parents or whoever, whatever you do, you'll never think it's enough. Um, and so, yeah, I hope you've begun to look at that and recognising just how much you were able to do for him and under the circumstances you found yourself in as well. So incredible. So there's obviously a journey through that and incredible that you actually did get through all that as well as you did. So... Yeah. Um, Susan's saying, have you written uh, down any of it or drawn in, out any of this? Uh, will, will that, do you mean through journaling, Susie, or do you mean has she written a book? Because that, that would be incredible. Just your recovery story in a book would be incredible. Um, but so that presumably you'll come down, uh, when we're talking about whether you've journaled or you've how you've dealt with it, moving mm -hmm. forward. I know it was, I think Michelle came to you, didn't she? It was... Did so. I was I was extremely blessed in that sense that um, Michelle and I had revolved in the same social circle for a few years, but we 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 didn't um, know each other so well at that time. But we had a mutual friend, and right. my um, my friend Pam had told Michelle about my situation, and Michelle reached out to me and sent yeah. her the angels. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. right time, right person by the sounds of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So Michelle's SERPA qualified practitioner. I'm yeah. not sure what you call it. She is, she? yes, SERPA trained, yes. She had her own journey with chronic pain, uh, which led her to become a practitioner. So she said all the right things to me. She knew exactly how I was feeling. Um, yeah, and allowed you to share those emotions, presumably. Did. Yeah. So, uh, so I was when I at, at the very worst. Um, I mean, it was at the very worst. It was terrifying. You know. Um, after all of that, I'd moved, and I was in this little house by myself, and I could barely get out of bed in the morning. Right. Um, I was screaming in agony, trying to get out of my bed in the morning. Um, if I had, a, if I managed to have a shower and eat something that day, that was all I could. That was me haven't had success wow so and that was but then if you think of the amount of, yeah if you think of the amount of, uh, that you'd lost and this now in that period presumably this the lack of meaning in your life what could you do in the situation that you found yourself in with all that pain and all that loss so uh yeah no wonder that pain was there no yeah. wonder that pain was there and that you I'm so thankful like you say you call her Michelle an angel to come at that time to be able to help you navigate through that if that pain hadn't been there honest to god I would have tried to keep going that was the kind right. of mindset then I would have even after Jeff died and people would come around to the house I would make them a cup of tea and ask them how they were doing and talk about their feelings and their loss and he was their friend and I should be there for them and I couldn't, I just couldn't drop the balls. And presumably you've learned that how that then creates even more stress for you and you've learned about this, your personality, how that plays a part and behaviours and learning about self-compassion. So how did this start? How did um, you start recognising all this? Um, 
so I had never really believed that I had an injury, but because it was kind of 10 months in and I was so broken, I was getting, re I was really, really scared. And I thought, yeah, my life was over. How am I ever going to get out of this? Um, just in a, in a state of shock and anxiety mm -hmm. and bereavement and post-traumatic stress and the whole works. So yeah. Michelle, Michelle reached out to me, put me onto Curable. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the curable panic button. Right, yeah. And that I, I was on my own. I yeah. was, I had left, had to leave my whole community. I didn't have any friends dropping around. No one was coming to see me or help me or make me a meal. Or my parents just kind of an old school and we'll just leave her and give her space kind of thing. Um, <coughs> Panic button on curable was always there for me in dark times. Mm. Uh, at the, end of the night when there was no one else to talk to or no one to call. And for those who've not heard of the panic button, do you want to mm -hmm. explain a bit about it? Um, so in the curable app, there's a little icon in the top right hand corner. I think it looks like a lightning bolt. I'm not can't quite remember, but um you you go in there when you're having a flare up or you're having a really intense experience or you're in a state of terror and there's a selection of options you can choose to do a meditation or a visual visualization or i can't remember a couple of other things so you, you make your choice and it'll take you through a gentle process to kind of calm you back down again mm -hmm. and I, I can't you know it's funny that i can't remember a lot of things. I remember the story and the facts, but I don't remember the pain. Right, that's probably good. <laughs> um, you know, and often when I would listen to the, because I was taking a lot of painkillers, whenever I did listen to a meditation or do a visualization on Curable, for the first two or three months, I just fell asleep. Mm. Yeah. Um, no it surprise. was more of a it was more of, um, I was having weekly sessions with Michelle also, but the weekly sessions, the Curable app and some books that Michelle had put me on to, like The Way Out by Alan Gordon, these things were like a raft that I just floated on for a few months. <laughs> yeah. I was still not strong enough to really do anything for myself, but mm -hmm. they, they gave me a lifeline mm. and hope, and I believed in it. Yeah, which is I'm pretty sure I had a really significant reduction in two or three weeks when I started working with Michelle. So that gave me a lot of strength. Mm. Wonderful. And you needed time to heal emotionally, physically, spiritually. And you needed that time. So that sleep was probably just what you needed as well. Yeah. Susie's yes. saying the last analogy is wonderful. It is. It's a really lovely. <laughs> It took me a long time to really, um, I think the key, the key, there's two key things that happened for me that I really want to share in the hope that they'll help other people. Mm -hmm. um, they were learning about self-love and compassion. Mm. Yeah. Um, so there was one night, so Michelle was teaching me all these tools that I could use, but it took me a while to really pick up the tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just, I needed to be carried for a while. Yeah, and, and I, I needed a lot of reassurance. And Michelle gave me a lot of love, and she always gave me permission to sleep, to slow down, to rest. To, you know, yeah. no part, no part of my brain was giving me that option for a long time because I was so used to being the fighter. Yes, um, yeah. I had been, I had been responsible for everything for such a long time. So those ideas about rest and relax and taking care of myself took a while to really filter through yeah but um the one night i was in bed and i was in an extreme amount of pain and it was one of those nights where i'd taken painkillers and they weren't working which was another piece of evidence that you know it wasn't the painkillers would take away sometimes but not other times what was the real reason i was in pain absolutely on this occasion, I was in a state of quite extreme terror in the dark in my room, probably cursing God for my experience, you know, and feeling abandoned. Yeah. And I did start to suddenly feel like a baby. 
Mm -hmm. I lay a baby alone and terrified in the room and I was crying in pain and no one was coming. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had an epiphany in that moment that I was the one who had to take myself in my arms. Lovely. And tell myself everything's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? We're going to get through this. Mm. Say, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. You know, and kind of that was me taking the reins for the first time. Mm. And take and be self soothe yeah. to calm the terror down, to get out of the panic state of mind, to get out of red alert and down into orange or amber. Even yeah, yeah. that was a turning point for me. Wonderful. Yeah, then that, sometimes it has to come from within, doesn't it? And it yeah. doesn't often. It doesn't matter how many times you're told things, like you were saying, Michelle was giving you thing, things, but it has to be when you're ready. It has to come, mm -hmm. and this this like epiphany that you had, absolutely. I mean, working with our inner child can be so helpful, but you only. It's about innately recognizing that yourself and experiencing yes. that. And it sounds like that was a real turning point for you. It was. I think before that point, I didn't necessarily believe that self-soothing myself would work. Because mm. I relied on someone external to do that for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or it had been Jeff. It had been my partner. He was always there to go, you know, after a busy day or a hard day, it's all right, you know, come here, I'll give you a hug. It's okay. Yeah. And yes. There was no one to do that anymore. And I had to learn to do it for myself. Mm. And, and recognising sorry, and recognising it can be helpful, and then uh, that yeah. gives you that agency, that self empowerment as well to recognise that you are there for yourself. Yeah. So yeah. that's become a really nice tool in my life, especially if I'm feeling anx anxious, which I still get a lot of anxiety. Or mm -hmm. so if I do have those days where my anxiety is kind of flaring up. I just treat it like a symptom and I start yeah. to say, okay, all right, we're having a panic. It's all right. Let's just sit down, take a minute. What do we need? What do we need here? And it, I've learned how to do that. Yeah. The second epiphany that I had was um, I was having a pain flare up and I was very angry about it. I was mm -hmm. sick sick to death of it I, I don't want to swear on Facebook but there was a lot of swearing going on I was cursing and swearing yelling at myself, hating myself big time yeah. really disappointed with myself really disappointed with my body my situation, my experience that I was in and I was just so angry and it was all being internalised and directed and focused at myself mm. for being a failure, for not grieving properly, why have I ended up in this situation why didn't I do things differently? Why didn't I see it coming? What the F is wrong with you? You're so useless. And then I heard my cat meowing somewhere down the corridor and I just instantly switched. Oh, my cat's called Georgie. Like, really? <laughs> I was like, Georgie, Georgie, I'm here for you. You know, what do you need? Are you hungry? Do you need a cuddle? And then I just, bing. I just noticed the difference with how I was talking to myself and how I was talking to my cat. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think I'd ever realized before how vicious I was towards myself. Yeah. And how, yeah. how that affected my body. We think that vicious nature, that anger, that frustration, that self-hatred or whatever was going on in there, rooted in perfectionism. Mm. And how it made me scrunch up my body absolutely <laughs> internalize all that negative negativity so um yeah. i did a lot of writing i did a lot of writing all through this process about all the things i was becoming aware of all the thoughts i was having um the the epiphanies the moments of enlightenment the things i was learning yeah. um i had to express a lot of anger about the, the experience that i'd been through mm-hmm yeah. feeling like abandoned by the world and how I'd had to carry it all myself. Yeah. So it was a lot of journaling. Fabulous. And it, um, it's such a lovely way to express, isn't it? You, yeah. 
Yeah. Sorry? To answer Susie's question from earlier, I think I've got three journals full um, oh, from the last three years. Yeah. And how much better is that being out there than in here and internalized? Like you were saying, all that you were talking about, but internalized against you. That actually journaling can be a way of really externalizing it, expressing it. So you're aware of it, um, but you're externalizing it and stopping it from being attacking you. Um, and then you can rationalize it and start looking at it. So when, when you look back now at your journey, um, okay, well, I'm just going to just answer Mike, Mike's question now. Did you keep your writing or throw it away? Um, some of it was kept and some was thrown away. Mm -hmm. depending on the, the nature of the exercise yes. some things some things i wanted to remember um just in case in the future i wanted to write an article or or share it with someone i've kept some yeah. and then other other exercises were just purely for getting my feelings out onto the page and i burned a lot of yeah paper. and that could be quite cathartic as well can't it burning it yeah, yeah. And I think, and that's the same with me, if I'm going to journal, if I'm going to be sort of really sort of just, it's just offloading thoughts, vicious thoughts, angry or whatever, I don't want to keep that. Um, so I will usually write over the writing or I'll rip it up and throw it away and or burn it. Um, so, yeah. So Susie says, I really hope you can sense the compassion and admiration that your story generates. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I hope, I really hope it does. Um... I guess I had been like that my whole life, but I had never really realised the way the way that I talked to myself and the way that I attacked myself. I had never really seen it so clearly until until that moment. And um, yeah, so how wonderful that you had that moment. Um, and I think it's that's common. You're not alone there. Um, and I remember in one of Michael Singer's books reading, you know, when he was saying, well you are not your thoughts and saying well you know if you're aware of your thoughts then who's having the thoughts and i love that and that really was the first time it was many years ago it was the first time that made me realize made me buy his book because i'd heard him talking to opera winfrey about that and that really made me think and went yeah that's interesting so i am not my thoughts i am aware so basically i'm awareness i'm aware of what's going on around me and what's in my thoughts the ego then starts going over and over with the, the, think, the thinking mind all the time. But we are so immersed in it all the time that we're not aware of it. So you're not alone there. So I'm going to end up with a cat coming up, coming up here. <laughs> Apologies. Now he's going to pull apart the, the, uh, the flowers. But that's ginger. So you've got a ginger cat as well. <laughs> My Georgie is ginger. Yeah. Your Georgie is ginger. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> oh dear. Well, it's sometimes I wonder if it's harder keeping him in or keeping him out and then having the scratching at the door and the yelling at the door. But uh, anyway, <laughs> it'll come down in the end. So that's wonderful that you've um, not only that you've come through, but um, through all this, but that you've had real learning from this. And it, it reminds me of how many people say, that they're thankful for their experience of the pain or the symptom just because they then have been on this personal development journey to really and been able to ch turn their lives around um mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're there as far as really recognizing how you created stress yourself first how vicious you were to yourself as you said um and what we can do and become so self-empowered and being able to turn things around I definitely feel a lot more um, assertive, stronger, more compassionate, more self-loving, yeah, fantastic, um, more present, patient, all the things I've always wanted to be. <laughs> so you've never been like that if you've not gone on this journey. And I think this is the this is beautiful to hear because there are so many people starting this journey who just don't can't see how anybody could be grateful for the pain that they're, that they're going through. But it's the learning from it and recognizing that the, the pain is a message. There's a message there. And it's about looking at it and really understanding it and, and getting to the authentic you as to who you really are. Uh, so that's wonderful. Um, 
So Susie says, it's simple humanity, strip raw, beautiful and terrifying, but at its essence, authentic. You, you always put things so beautifully, Susie. She's very creative as Susie. <laughs> Uh, I'd never come out with things quite as beautiful as that. But thank you, Susie. Um, and she asked if you've turned to, more towards nature, which could be so calming. Well, when Jeff was struggling with cancer, we lived right on the beach. Wow. Like, right on the beach. So that was a massive blessing on our journey. Um, I, I think... Living, you know, I could go to the beach three times a day if I wanted. I'd literally went out my house and I was on the sand. Um, I love Australia after that. Um, and before we lived in New Brighton, we we had a hundred acre farm. So mm -hmm. nature's always been a massive part of my life. Having to leave the Byron Shire after the flood and move to a town surrounded by five motorways was not <laughs> what I thought I needed when I was in such a, an injured state. But when I had to leave because of the flood and move, I just asked the universe to help me feel safe. Mm. I just, just said, give me somewhere to feel safe. And I rented this lovely, cute little house with a grassy, a, front, a grassy lawn in the front and a beautiful big pine tree in the garden. And the house reminded me a lot of a couple of other places I've lived before where I felt safe. So I spent a lot of time lying, just lying out on the grass in my front yard mm -hmm. with, with my cat for those <laughs> six months. <laughs> um, 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 another blessing that came out of it was that, you know, I haven't lived in the same town as my family for 30 years. And uh, the situation that I found myself in forced me to move towards them. And so we've spent the last 12 to 18 months reconnecting getting to know each other, forming stronger bonds. Um, and that's been really beautiful. So the universe answered, gave you what you wanted, what you needed. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. I just want to say if anybody's got any questions they want to ask, we're going to be finishing soon. So if you've got any questions you want to ask before we finish, then uh, get them in there now while you've got Emma here. Um, but yeah, I think it is it is that finding somewhere safe, isn't it? Um, and as you say, yes, it might be a beach somewhere, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. Uh, and it's you feeling safe with, yes, nature is wonderful and it's really lovely, even if it's gra just grass to have there. But it's also having that social interaction, connections. Um, it, taught me, it taught me a lot about myself, this, this mm -hmm. whole journey, like... Yeah. Um, Initially, the wrench of having to leave the area where I'd lived for 12 years, where I had lots of connections, lots of friendships, community, mm. wonderful neighbours, um, you know, and being wrenched out of that situation and plonked somewhere where I didn't really know anyone except my mum and dad. Mm. It felt really harsh at first, but, but even that was really important for me because I'm quite... Um, I need a lot of space and downtime, and it was better for me to be out of my community and in a cave, mm. in mm. a cave, by myself, healing, going through my process. Because I just would have kept taking care of others, or I would have yeah. kept taking other people's opinions, or other people's ideas, or other people's thoughts, or their beliefs, and, and getting confused. And it was a real opportunity. Yeah be in my own space, be by myself, work out what I needed, what I wanted, without yeah. lots of influences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It sounded like that's just what you needed at that time. Yeah. So Barbara's saying he, she likes Alan Gordon, such a healthy, persistent pain. Uh, yeah, Alan Gordon is one of the, uh, another practitioner, and obviously he has, trains practitioners as well. I've known Alan since 2008, uh, eight, nine. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of practitioners out there now, thank goodness. Um, so many people able to help and support people. Uh, so Susie, the natural world exists in a city too. Absolutely, the earth below the sky above a tree can all make us feel connected to the universe if we're on our own. Absolutely. Uh, and, I, and I remember um, when both my kids were abroad many years ago and sit, just sitting on a hill and just imagining, you know, unconditional love and universal consciousness and just imagining being connected that my son was in Australia at the time my daughter was in Austria 
Um, and it, I just really felt that connection, just sitting there. They weren't with me, they were miles away, and yet it was just sitting, as you say, Susie, the sky above, the earth below, it was wonderful. Um, so Mike says, are you saying you needed to find safety in yourself? I needed to learn to trust myself, that I could take care of myself and that I didn't need someone else to do that for me. And back at the beginning of this journey, I didn't know that I had that strength. Mm. And there were things that I had to learn, like like when you go to school to learn anything, it was a, it was a learning. It didn't all just drop in. Um, mm. there, was the, there was theory and there was practice. Yeah. And now I feel really strong and I feel like I can do anything I want. If I choose to, I can, yes. I can make those choices for myself and trust myself to do whatever I want to do. And isn't it interesting to hear that when you say beforehand you were always looking after everybody else. You could help them and do everything they needed. Um, but this is about learning you to turn inwards and start to recognise that you can do that for yourself as well. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so Susie says the natural world is also always changing, which gives hope that if we flow like a river, there can be change for us too. Absolutely. And we often don't know what's right for us, for ourselves. Um, there were two things, two other things that really helped me through all of this. And one was my, I have a really deep spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, I always believe that everything that happens to us happens for a reason. Yeah. So that gives me a lot of strength. And I'm also an astrologer. Right. So when, before my partner passed away, he would say to me, can you see anything in my astrology? And I would look at his astrology and I, I, and I couldn't. And, and I don't think I was meant to. Right. But I, look at, I would look at mine and I would say to him, it's not looking good for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't. It, it looked like I was going to go on a really difficult journey. Right, um, and and I did. Mm. So and I, and I could also see an end to that journey through the astrology as well. And mm. and after he died, I could then see this the signs in his chart that were showing when it would happen. But at the time, I couldn't see it, and I, I think I really wasn't meant to. Mm. So um, the universe always gives me a lot of strength. But you still have, even with faith, you still have dark, dark moments when you feel abandoned and lost. Mm -hmm. And then come friends and community members and people you bump into on a walk one day. Um, yeah. A lot of support came to me from places. Um, I would just be out on a walk and one day a man just said to me, are you okay? You know, and then mm -hmm. we just chatted. And we would meet every day on our walk and catch up. And I've, I've met a lot of people. Yeah. And it is about letting go and allowing the flow. And to say, I'm always fascinated by who I'm going to sit next to in a train or, like you say, meet, meet somewhere on a walk. It's always interesting. And it is as if things are meant to happen. Anyway, we're not going to go into that now, but I want to thank everybody else for joining us. Um, thank you for your uh, wisdom, Susie, as well. <clears throat> um, and I hope you found that very helpful. Uh, I, I think you're an incredible woman, Emma. Um, you've been on an amazing journey uh, and you should be very proud of um, how far you've come. And I'm interested to see your journey moving forward as well. <laughs> thank you. That's, thank you very much for having me. And um, my, my huge thanks to Michelle. She's been supporting me now for a year and a half. And um, I still have occasional calls with Michelle when I need to. And um, so with, thank you to Serpa for for doing the work that you all do. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And we'll put, we'll put a link to Michelle's uh, uh, website below the, vid, the recorded video as well. So anybody can have a look at that. It's lovely to see the beginning of a wave of new science emerging that will help a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Um, well, thank you, Emma. I really appreciate you taking your time to uh, share your story, which I know will help so many people. I hope so. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.